Hey everybody, Gary here with Guitar Tricks, and in this video we're going to go over guitar and music terminology that you're going to encounter as you start getting into guitar playing. So these are going to be terms that have to do with the instrument itself, techniques on the instrument, music theory terms that you're going to hear. So I'm going to give you a whole bunch of terms and talk through them so that when you hear these as you're taking lessons, as you're going through videos, you'll know what people are talking about and you'll know what you're talking about. Before we get into the lesson, please go ahead and click subscribe and tap that bell so that you get all the latest and greatest content from Guitar Tricks. All right, let's get into it. So let's start with the actual instrument and talk about some terminology there. I'm gonna go through this one quick. So the strings pass from the nut to the bridge, right? Here's the bridge and here's the nut. On an electric guitar, you'll also have intonation saddles, and those little string saddles can go forwards and backwards fine-tuning the guitar. On an acoustic, it's fixed. Then we've got the body of the guitar. We can call this the lower bout, the upper bout. We've got the sound hole. On some guitars, you have cutaways or a double cutaway, especially on electric guitars. Like a Stratocaster has a double cutaway, whereas a Les Paul has a single cutaway. So you'll hear the term single cut. Obviously, we have the neck of the guitar, we have the fretboard of the guitar, we have the fret wires, right? We have the fret markers. The one with two markers is the 12th fret, easy to remember because you have that number two. One, two, 12th fret right there. That indicates the octave. So when we have zero and then 12, that's an octave. The term octave means the same note but vibrating at twice the frequency. So this is an E, and this is an E. If a little kid sang an E, they would sing this one probably. La, and I would sing this one maybe. La, or this one. La, la. All right, so those are all E, but they're vibrating at one frequency, then double, and then you keep going. All right, then we've got, like I said, the nut. The strings pass through the nut slots and then two, the tuning pegs, which is on the headstock, right? Then we've got the pitch of the headstock. That means that it goes on this slope right here. A fen Fender guitars don't have a headstock pitch. They go straight, but they have little string retainers. Gibson guitars and guitars like this do have a headstock pitch. Then some terminology that refers to differences on guitars. One is scale length, the distance from the nut to the bridge is called the scale length. On this guitar, it's 25 inches. On, let's say, a Fender Stratocaster or most Fender guitars, it's 25 and a half inches. A lot of Martin guitars, too, 25 and a half inches. Then, there's a shorter scale, 24.75 inches, like a Gibson Les Paul and most Gibson acoustics. And then 25 is somewhere in the middle. Then you have short scale guitars, which are 24 inches and below. Three quarter could be 23 inches, 22 inches. A higher scale length will give you a, a little more clarity and string definition between the strings. So when you play a chord with a longer scale guitar, each note is gonna be more defined. With a shorter scale guitar, they're gonna kind of blend together. It'll be a warmer tone. All right, then other things that are unique to each guitar, nut width. Nut width is just how much width there is at this part of the guitar. Then you have string spacing, and that's how much width there is on this part of the guitar. So smaller nut width and smaller string spacing means you move less, everything's closer together. That could be better for rhythm guitar where you're always hitting all the strings. It can be worse for finger style and single note playing because things could kind of get in the way. Your fingers can get in the way. So everyone has their own preference regarding nut width and string spacing, but it's something you'll encounter. Another thing is neck depth and neck back contour. So the neck depth is the distance from the fretboard to the back of the neck. And usually it's anywhere between three quarters of an inch to a full inch. A lot of times it starts out smaller and gets thicker as you go along. This guitar is about 0.85 all the way across. It's a straight neck depth all the way across. This is an Eastman guitar. That's something unique to them. Generally, uh, in the 80s, when metal really got really popular, necks started to get really thin. They're starting to get thicker again like they were in the 50s, closer to one inch as opposed to closer to 0.75. 
Then you have the contour. You could have a C shape, which is just a perfect C. You could have a U shape, where it's, it comes up, but then it flattens out. You could have a V neck, which is more of a V. So there's different back contours, and again, everyone has their own preference there. And then another thing is the fretboard radius, which refers to the amount of roundness of the fretboard. Now, classical guitars are flat. Electric guitars and steel string guitars, there's some sort of radius. This guitar has a 12 inch radius. That means you can imagine a circle where that measures from the middle of the circle to the top 12 inches, and that's gonna be that right there. Now, fretboard radius goes anywhere from 7.25 inches all the way up to 20 inches, for instance. And then, like I said, it can be flat on a classical guitar. There's a such thing as compound radius where it's rounder over here, more comfortable for chords, and then it gets flatter as you go up to the top, which allows for big dramatic string bends where you don't fret out. Because if you have a really low fretboard radius that's really round, as you push the string up, it can what they call fret out. That means you push the string up and it starts to buzz on one of these higher frets. So generally, metal players and players that do a lot of string bending mm -hmm. like a flatter radius so they don't fret out. All right, then we've got the strings of the guitar. Real quick, you're gonna hear, hear terminology about strings. People are gonna say, oh, I like nines, I like tens, I like eights, I like twelves. That refers to the size, the gauge, of your high E string, this string. On this guitar, I have 11s right now. So that means this string is an 11, and it goes to about a 52 or a 54, I believe, on the low E string. On my electric guitar, I prefer 10s, 10 to 48, I believe, is what I use on my electric guitar. So uh, that, again, is personal preference. If you're just starting out, you might want to use lighter gauge strings, say 9s on your electrics, and maybe 11s or even 10s on your acoustic. I like 11s on the acoustic because I like to bend strings even on acoustic, and it's easier. When you get into 12s and 13s on an acoustic, it, be, it could be tough. Now, another thing you're gonna hear about is string material. You'll hear about nylon strings, steel strings, alloy strings, nickel alloy strings, for instance. So, on a guitar like this, a steel string acoustic, these, uh, the E string and the B string are plain steel, and the other ones are steel core, and they're wound with copper. Now you'll hear things like plain G or wound G. That refers to the G string. The G string with thicker strings is often wound, but sometimes it's made to be plain. And the reason why players might prefer a plain G string is it's far easier to bend a plain G string than a wound G string. So wound just means you have a core with those windings and the plain string, there's no windings around it. It's just the core. Nylon strings are what are on classical guitars or flamenco guitars. And then alloy is often used for electric guitars, like a nickel alloy. So there's some percentage of steel and nickel. And uh, generally the tension of electric strings is less, even with the same diameter as steel string guitars. And then the tension how soft it feels on your fingers and how easy it is to move them around is even less on nylon. So as far as the kind of strings that are easiest on your fingers, the easiest is nylon, then comes electric strings, then comes steel strings that are on acoustic. Now there are variations on acoustic. Some of them are a little stiffer than others. The stiffer a string, the brighter it's gonna sound. Now, no matter what strings you have, if your action is too high, they're gonna be hard to play. So action refers to the distance between the fret and your string. Action could be measured at the first fret, the fifth fret, the twelfth fret, because from the nut it's going to start to get higher and higher. Generally, the higher your action, the harder to play, but the better the tone. When the strings have a lot of freedom to vibrate, they generally sustain longer and sound better. This guitar is very high action. It's kind of a pain to play. But the other thing is if your guitar is starting to buzz, you can remedy that by raising your action a little, but it's harder to play. A lot of times if a guitar hasn't had a proper setup in a while, and we'll get to that term, 
uh, it can't go too low without buzzing happen happening. So that brings us to the term setup. So a setup is what a guitar tech will do to make sure your intonation is right, meaning the guitar is in tune all over the neck. That's what intonation means. Sometimes it could be in tune open, like here, but then not at the 12th fret. This one's pretty good. Not really on that one. This one, a couple of my strings, not perfect, but uh, that's usually what people will do to test the intonation. They'll see is it in tune open, and then on the 12th fret, and then adjust the bridge accordingly. Like I said, you can't adjust an acoustic guitar. But so that's one thing they'll do. The other thing they'll do is check to see if the frets are all level, meaning if you put a straight beam over the frets, are there any high spots? If there are, then they'll grind down little parts of the frets to make it perfectly flat. Then once all your frets are uh, flat, they'll also adjust the neck relief. Now relief refers to if the neck uh, goes sh perfectly straight, goes back bows, or goes a little bit this way, bows this way. Usually there's a little bit of relief or it's flat. If you're going the opposite direction, obviously that's not good and you'll get fret buzz and it's bad for the neck. So the more you loosen the truss rod, the more it goes from straight to a little bit of relief. So that's another thing that they'll do. They'll find the perfect ratio of flat frets a little bit of relief, and then that's how they set the action. The truss rod is a steel bar that runs inside the neck, and it can be made stiffer or looser, and that affects the relief. So that's what a setup is gonna do. The fret work is not part of a basic setup, but if your guitar has a lot of raised frets and things, that's something that could be worth investing a couple hundred dollars and having a tech really flatten out your frets, make sure the whole fretboard is flat, so that you can get some nice low action without buzzing. All right, so now that we're at the word action, we're gonna go in alphabetical order. So another thing is altered tuning or open tuning. So obviously the guitar is tuned E, A, D, G, B, E. One altered tuning would be E flat. You'll hear about E flat tuning. That's just if you make the E and E flat and then tune all the strings just like you would but in relation to E flat. So everything goes down one half step. So the E becomes an E flat, the A an A flat, the D a D flat, the G a G flat, the B a B flat, and then that other E and E flat. Now a lot of players play like this, maybe one out of 10 for instance. A lot of blues players, Hendrix played this way, Stevie Ray Vaughan played this way. A lot of people play like that. It gives the strings a more slinky feel and some people like the tone better, say it's a little deeper. So that's one altered tuning. Open tuning would be where you tune your whole guitar to an open chord. So one famous one is say dadgad. So I can take my E and tune it to a D. So now I have D, A, D, my G, G, my B I'm gonna make an A. And then my E, I'm gonna make a D. So with this tuning, my guitar is tuned to a D sus4 chord. Really nice chord. And now I can just strum along and just play single notes. So open tunings could be a lot of fun because it's kind of hard to hit a wrong note. And for beginners, you can just go in an open tuning and take it from there. So I'll put a few open tunings right there that you could experiment with. Going down the A's, alternate picking. That is just when you go down and then up again, like this. As opposed to all downs. The next term is arpeggio. Arpeggio is when you take a chord, and in that position, play all the chord tones instead of the actual chord with all the notes at once, like this. 
you could think of it as just a broken chord. So an arpeggio pattern could be something like. So it's just an arpeggio pattern. I'm playing the notes in the chord broken up. The next term is bar chord. That's what I just played. Even though it's bar, B-A-R-R-E, it really is just like a B-A-R bar. You're making your finger like a bar, almost like a capo with your first finger, and then playing the chord next to it. So your finger becomes the nut. You know, here's a bar chord, here's a bar chord. Here's another one. Now sometimes you might bar with this finger too. See that? That's a C major chord. That's a G major chord. Bending, that one's self-explanatory. Just taking a note, bending it up. Capo. This is an essential tool for any guitar player at any level, but especially great for beginners because you can just learn your basic open chords. You know, G, A, A minor, C, D minor, D major, E minor, E major, and use those chords to play in other keys. Like let's say a song was in G sharp instead of G, then you just put the capo on the first fret. Now when I play a G, it's a G sharp. If I go on the second fret, I play a G, it's actually an A. Capo on the third fret, I play a G chord, it's actually an A sharp. So this allows you to just use one set of chords to play in any key. Another word you're gonna hear is caged. So the caged system is just a way to conceptualize the different positions of the fretboard. And caged refers to C, the way this chord looks and the way it's shaped, C chord, A, G, E, and D. These are our basic chord shapes, all right? And for any chord, we could play it using one of those shapes. Let's say we took the, the chord C. Here's the C chord in the C shape. Here is the C chord in the A shape. Here is the C chord in the G shape. Here is the C chord in the E shape. And then here is the C chord in the D shape. So every chord has these five shapes. And then you can think of the surrounding scale that goes with it. So if I go backwards using this D shape, we have this scale. This one, this one, oops, I skipped over this one, and then here, so it's just a way to organize these chord shapes with the scale shapes. It's a great thing to know, I wouldn't start there. So the word chord, what is a chord? All right, before I explain a chord, let's talk about two other terms, chromatic and scale and major scale. Okay, so the chromatic scale, the word chromatic means all of the notes in music and there are 12 of them. And the word chromatic means step by step. From here, step by step, this is the chromatic scale I'm playing. Most music is not written in the chromatic scale. The chromatic scale just refers to all the possible notes, 12 of them. Before I get back to where I started at twice the frequency, which we called the octave. So if this is an F, F, F sharp G, G sharp A, A sharp B, C, C sharp D, D sharp E, F. Those are all 12 notes in the chromatic scale. Now, to make a scale, the com most common one, the major scale for instance, I mix together what we call half steps and whole steps. A whole step is where I skip over a note in the chromatic scale, and a half step is where I go just one note over without skipping anything. So starting on that F, if I wanted to make an F major scale, I go whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, whole step, half step. And there's do re mi fa so la ti do. There's the major scale. So it's this combination of half steps and whole steps. Now, to make a chord, 
we take three notes within that scale and play them at the same time. The most basic kind of chord is a triad, meaning three, three notes. So a normal chord has three notes, a root, a third, and a fifth. Let's take D for example. The notes in a D chord are the root D, E, F sharp is the third, D, E, F sharp, G, A is the fifth. And I'm just counting up the musical alphabet. And to create a chord, we play hopscotch. We skip over notes. So we've got the root, D, we skip over the second note in the scale, we get the third note, which is F sharp, D, E, F sharp, we skip over the fourth note to get to the fifth note, which is A. So D, F sharp, A, that would be a normal D chord. Well, a seventh chord, instead of just root, third, fifth, we have root, third, fifth, seventh. And once we add that extra note, we're gonna notate that in the chord symbol. So that's why you'll see D7. Now, to make matters even more confusing, you have D7, D minor seven, D major seven. So even though there's just one minor and one major, we have three seventh chords. And the reason for that is we can have a major chord with a minor seventh, and we could have a minor chord with a minor seventh, and we could have a major chord with a major seventh. So we've got three main options there, and those are the three most common. There's also diminished seventh, augmented seventh, but the three that you're gonna use 95% of the time are major seven, dominant seven, and minor seven. A major or minor chord has a root, a third, and a fifth. And the third is the note that defines it as either major or minor. If it has a regular third, it's major. If it has a flat third, it's minor. A sus chord doesn't have a third at all. Sort of like a power chord. A power chord is just root and fifth. But the sus chord, instead of having the third, it's replaced with either the four or the two. So you either go up to the four or down to the two. So a sus chord has root, either two or four, and fifth. Now what is a chord voicing? Well, just like we did with the caged earlier, these are different chord voicings. The chord voicing is just any arrangement or any fingering of a chord. So if I have a C chord, the notes are C, E, and G. Here's one way to play C, E, and G. Some of them repeat, some of the C's, E's, and G's repeat. Here's another voicing. Here's another voicing and another voicing. So these are different ways, different voicings of the chord C. Slash chord, what is a slash chord? That's when you see something like C slash G. That means you have a C chord, but the lowest note is going to be a G. Like here's a C chord, but I'm gonna put a G as the lowest note. So when you see a slash chord, it indicates don't put the root note of that chord as the lowest note. Like if it's a C chord, generally C would be the lowest note. It's saying instead make G the lowest note. So when you see C slash G, it means C chord over a G note, and meaning over a G bass note. Double stop. We did a video on double stops recently. Double stops are kind of like partial chords. You're gonna have two notes. So a double stop literally just means playing two notes at the same time, like this. Right, I'm playing these two together. So anytime I play two notes at the same time. Drop D tuning. We talked about some altered tunings earlier. Drop D is just where you take that E and tune it to a D. This one's great because you could play power chords like this. that's a fun thing to do, just tune that low E to a D, and then you get this one finger power chord by barring the lowest three strings. And you could pretty much just do any fret and put together these cool drop D power chord ideas. So the term power chord, what is a power chord? So we talked about a triad, and in a triad we have a root note, a third, and a fifth. Because we started on the first note, we skipped the second, then we have a third, we skipped the fourth, then we have a fifth. Root, third, fifth. Power chord is where we take away the third and we just have root and fifth. The root and the fifth are very neutral. They're not major or minor. The middle note is what makes a chord major or minor, the third. So a power chord is just a root and a fifth and there's no major or minor. So it sounds very open. Power chord 
power chords are very neutral sounding and they're great with distortion and rock. Uh, they're just kind of like glorified bass notes because that root and that fifth are so closely related that it just gives it a huge sound uh, and it's really flexible because you're not dealing with the major or minor thing which really kind of gets your ear, it creates more restriction. Power chords have far less restriction. Finger style. Finger style is just when we play with our fingers as opposed to a pick. We could use a thumb pick which sticks out which attaches to the thumb and gives the bass note a bigger sound than just using your thumb. But that's all that is. Verse flat pick playing, which is just with one of these flat picks, the most popular being a teardrop size. If I want to put the flat pick with my fingers together, that's called hybrid picking. So I'm going to try to play the same thing I just did. So obviously I'd have to work on that, but it is possible to use the pick and the fingers together. As you just saw on the spot, I tried to do it. Um, there are some people that are masters of that technique. They, they have the pick, but they also mix in their fingers a lot and get the best of both worlds. All right, so we're still on H hammer-on. A hammer-on is literally how it sounds. We play one note and we hammer on another note with one of our other fingers. Right, so I'm playing one note here, but I'm getting four because I'm doing the hammer. And while we're on hammer on, I'm gonna throw in pull off. Skip to P for a minute. Pull off is the opposite where we keep these fingers planted, but we pull off with the fretted finger. We use our finger to pull down and out to pluck the note. Harmonics. There's a few different ways to play harmonics on guitar. One way is to rest your finger lightly over certain frets. It works really good on the 12th fret. So right on that 12th fret, I rest my finger right over the fret wire and just make very little contact. It's super light and it's got to be in the right spot. If I go too far forward or back, it won't work. It's got to be right over the fret wire and the skin just lightly touches the string without pressing it down. That's one way to do that. Another way to do it is after you pick a note, to hit the string with a little bit of skin. Now the way that I do it, I pick the note and then I use the knuckle of my middle finger to lightly touch the string. Maybe you could hear that. Now obviously this sounds way more dramatic with distortion than on an acoustic guitar. Interval. So the interval is simply the distance between one note to another. So for instance, this note to this note is the interval of a major third. From this note to this note is a fourth. This note to this note is a fifth. This note to this note is a second. This note to this note is an octave. So th these are just intervals, the distance between notes. Now, relative pitch, someone that has good relative pitch is someone that hears intervals really well. That means they could hear a chord progression and, and understand the structure in their ear uh, very quickly. That means you have good relative pitch. Perfect pitch means you know what a note is by itself, not relative to another note. Perfect pitch is far less important, practically speaking, than relative pitch. Because all relative pitch requires you know, as soon as you know the key, boom, you're off and running. And that's pretty easy to figure out on your instrument pretty quickly. Perfect pitch obviously is a great superpower, but relative pitch for all intents and purposes is an amazing skill that we could all develop.
It's something you could develop. If you don't have perfect pitch by the time you're like five years old, research has shown you're probably not gonna get it. But again, it's not that important. Relative pitch is super important. We're up to L, lead guitar. Lead guitar just refers to guitar players that are mostly playing the melody of a song or the solos or the riffs. So while one player might be going, that's your rhythm guitar player, the other player might be going, you know, that would be the, the lead part on top of the. So uh, the lead guitar player might not necessarily be soloing the whole time, but they're playing the riff things that go on top, higher up on the guitar, and the rhythm guitar player is just holding down the rhythm and the chords. But generally someone that aspires to be a better lead guitar player is really interested in soloing and improvisation. Uh, but the truth is there is an excess of lead guitar players and a shortage of really great rhythm guitar players that can just really keep good time and create a groove. So it's absolutely worth developing both those skills. Modulation or modulate. This just simply means when you change keys within a song. Like let's say you're in the key of G. I just modulated from the key of G to the key of C. So somewhere within a song, there's an alteration to a chord that leads us to a new chord that suddenly becomes the home chord. So I went from G major to C major. Not very common, but you do see it sometimes. The most common modulation is going from major to relative minor. So for instance, in the key of G, the key E minor is so very closely related to G. They have the same chords and the same notes. So you might hear a verse that's in E minor, for instance. And then suddenly, a chorus that goes to G major. So I just kind of went from the relative minor to the relative major. That you'll see all the time. Other modulations to unrelated keys, not quite as much. Popular in jazz and classical music. Positions. So when I say we're in third position, that means your index finger goes to the third fret. And, we're, and that and whatever we play has your index finger on the third fret. So the position refers to where the index finger is on what fret. So for instance, if I said play a G major scale in the second position, that would be this right here. Even though the first note I played was with the second finger on the third fret, the index finger covered the second fret. So that was a second position scale. Slide. A slide is simply when you play a note and you slide your finger up to another note. We could slide up, we could slide down. We could slide full chords. Strumming. So strumming is just where you use your hand or a pick to go through all the strings or a grouping of strings to play a chord like this. The opposite of that would be using the fingers to either pluck them all simultaneously or arpeggiated, a term we used earlier. So even though here I'm playing them literally at the exact same moment, that's not strumming. Strumming is a really fast succession of strings, one at a time, but so fast that it sounds like you're playing them all at the same time. Tablature. Now, this term is being misused constantly. People are calling anything tab that shows you how to play notes. They're calling chord diagrams tab, they're calling scale diagrams tab, they're calling lead sheets tab, it's not all tab. Tablature is the six straight lines which represent the strings with numbers on them representing fret numbers. That's tablature. A lead sheet or a chord sheet used interchangeably is where you just have the names of the chords written out usually on top of lyrics. 
that's a chord sheet or a lead sheet. A score is where you have notation, Western staff notation. A chord diagram is just the grid with the strings and the dots showing you where to put your fingers. Scale diagram is like a chord diagram, but usually instead of being uh, straight up and down, it's side to side. These are all different things. Tablature is just the lines with the fret numbers. Tapping. Tapping refers to where you use your right hand fingers to play notes. Something I don't usually do, but that was fun. I think I'm gonna do that more often. So you just tap. It's almost like a hammer-on with your right hand. But usually it's, it's after you tap on, you kind of pull off. Just like that. Transcribing. To me, the most important thing you could do, transcribing just means learning by ear, listening to something, figuring it out. That's transcribing. Generally refers to figuring something out, note for note exact, what's happening. You could take transcribing one step further and make a transcription, which is where you write it down uh, in whatever way you want to write it down, but you're actually, you're either tabbing it out, you're notating it, that's a transcription, but the act of transcribing is just listening and playing exactly what you hear. Transposing. Transposing is where you just take a piece of music and you shift it to a new key, but play it exactly the same way. Here's an example. If I took the chord progression G, C, D, There is a relative structure going on. We've got a one chord G to a four chord G, A, B, C to a five chord D. So in the key of G, G, A, B, C, D, we have one, four, five. Now, if I want to translate that to the key of A, A, D, E. Because we have the one, the four, the five, A, D, E, and the key of G, that was G, C, D. Tremolo versus vibrato. Tremolo is a fluctuation in volume. Tremolo picking would be where you take a note and you play it really fast because you could think of it as a strobe effect. It's going in and out of volume. You can get a tremolo pedal, you can get a volume pedal, you could use a volume knob on an electric guitar to do tremolo. Vibrato, on the other hand, is going in and out of pitch. It's a rapid alteration of pitch, back and forth. You could do it with chords, single notes. So that's the difference between vibrato, vibrato and tremolo. With a whammy bar, that's actually, if you just you know do it fast like that, that's actually vibrato, even though Leo Fender famously misnamed his vibrato unit, a tremolo unit, even though it has nothing to do with tremolo. It was just, it was named the wrong way, but people still think of it as a tremolo. Uh, it's just one of those things. A few of the most essential guitar effects that you're gonna hear about are reverb. So reverb, usually when it's in an amplifier, there is a casing of springs, and the sound goes through there and it reverberates. It's not an echo, it's not like, hey, hey, hey. It's just a bit of a reverberation, like you're in a room where it's just kind of swirling around. It's more of a swirling. It's the effect that's used most often. You hardly ever hear a guitar player with no reverb. Now you'll hear people talk about that's too dry or that's too wet. Wet generally means a lot of reverb, dry means no reverb. Delay, digital delay, that is where you play something and it echoes. Da, 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 da. That's a delay effect. So reverb is just the kind of swirling trail off of a note, whereas delay is the repetition of a note. Overdrive refers to uh, when, you, when you push an amp too hard to its capacity, you get this, this breakup, this distortion, but it's called overdrive. This breakup, it's a mild, you're overdriving your amp. Distortion takes the signal and really distorts it to create a new sound. So in terms of level, you have clean, slight overdrive, heavy overdrive, distortion, fuzz is a kind of distortion, right? Uh, a lot of metal players or really heavy players will mix together the 
distortion with the delay, with the reverb, with compressor, and they end up getting a huge sound with very little effort. Whereas more bluesy, funky, r and it's usually very clean, maybe a little bit of mild overdrive. All right, that's all the terminology that I'm gonna cover today. If you have any questions, if I left anything out, if there's any terms, please leave a comment and we'll be sure to clarify whatever terms that you were hoping you would learn in here, but you didn't. All right, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I hope you learned something new. If you wanna learn more about playing guitar, head over to guitartricks.com and I will see you guys in the next lesson. Happy playing.